Hello, it's Jamie J. We're getting ready to go live with, okay, I'm pretty excited about this with Dan Goldstern of dojo.co. If you know me, you know me, I geek out on uh, uh, workplace development, working remotely, distributed workforces, all of that kind of stuff. And stay tuned because uh, we're going to have an unbelievable conversation that is so relevant in COVID, post-COVID, However you're seeing this, uh, if you're seeing it on the replay, this is going to be crazy. So if you are a business owner, business leader, manager, team leader, you have to tune into this. So be right back in about 38 seconds with an explosive conversation with Dan Goldstein. <laughs> Hello, hello. Welcome to Live with Bottleneck. My name is Jamie J, and I am the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. Uh, there you go. But that's not why we're here today. Today, we're here to find out ways that you can stop the bottleneck in your business by talking to Dan Goldstern. Now, uh, we're going to be talking to about the future of work in the workplace. And Dan is the co-founder of Dojo. And so why is uh, Dan here? Why is he going to help you stop the bottleneck in your business? Let me tell you a little bit about him. Dan Goldstern is co-founder of Dojo, dojo.co. It's an artificial intelligence or AI platform that helps companies design better and safer, 2020 keyword, and safer work places. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, he has been working with business leaders across industries to reimagine the future of work and the changing role of the office. He pre his previous experience includes working on economic development, labor, and housing policy in the New York City Mayor's Office and on large-scale real estate development projects with Silverstein Properties, and they're massive. He studied political theory at the University of Pennsylvania and was a Schwarzman Scholar in Beijing. In his spare time, Dan enjoys riding around New York City on his bicycle. That's fantastic. Uh, and without any further ado, I want to jump right into this. We were in the green room talking a, lot, a little bit about what uh, we were going to talk to uh, about today, and I started getting off on a tangent. So I want to bring him in. Dan, uh, thank you so much for uh, jumping on live with Bottleneck. Hey, Jamie. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, right off the bat, I wonder if maybe you can tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your background. Um, I did go into that a little bit on your bio, because as soon as you tell us a little bit more about you, I want to jump into this conversation. It's super exciting to me. Yeah. Well, Jamie, you covered the bicycle, so I think we're more than 50% of the way there. <laughs> but honestly, the last few months, um, I have I and my team, we've been busy helping companies uh, across the country um, and outside the country too now, figure out how to uh, move forward. Uh, and whether that's moving forward with their existing real estate footprint, or whether that's starting to transition to more of a hybrid model or an entirely remote model. And Jamie, you obviously and, and your listeners too know, know a bit about that. Um, we've been really in the thick of it and I'm excited to talk to you about that. Well, and again, thank you so much for jumping on this call. I think it's uh, this is a this is a strange time, uh, to say the least. Um, this I I was part of um, somebody I forgot who it was. Somebody sent me the link to the video that I watched with uh, your partner Guy uh, Vardy, and you were talking about, um, in essence, distributed workforce. You were talking kind of how offices are now trying to rearrange to find the most productivity um, with the best collaboration. And before I ask this question, I do want to point out three things. I took a ton of notes from that, by the way. Right. I can't over it. But there was three reasons why it's difficult to have a distributed workforce. And I want to also 
when I don't always talk about the positive, I always talk about the challenges associated with those. But the three reasons they came up with, um, based on research in academia since 2000, according to Guy, was building trust, conflict resolution, and personality traits. And one of the examples he talked about was uh, there was a, a software development company and their line of code, every single developer was way more productive, writing more lines of code, but where the ball was dropped is getting out different versions or releasing new, new products because they started finding bugs from team to team because the collaboration was missing. Even though the pro productivity was there, collaboration was down. And I wonder if maybe you can talk to that a little bit and how Dojo can maybe help fix that challenge because that's a challenge i believe that happens in every single company or that is happening in every single company right now because this is all new yeah yeah so you know people have a tendency to uh sort of either jump to an extreme or to think in terms of binaries so right now you've got companies that are filing off on either side of this question saying we're coming back to the office or we're not coming back to the office you know, you've got the tech companies, Facebook and Twitter and so on, that are making this big public case for why they don't need the workplace. And it's interesting because when we look at that um, and we see the data, right? We're a data-driven company. We crunch numbers from all of our customers. Uh, when we look at that, we see that there's nuance in this question. Certain things an office is indispensable for. Other things you don't need to schlep to your office to commute to sit uh, at your desk and do heads down work for the entire day, right? So when we work with a customer, we always start by first asking and trying to understand through data what it is that employees are spending their time doing. So, you know, you just mentioned one uh, piece of research and Guy's really fond of that one. Another piece of research that came out over the last four months is a survey of, I believe, 3,000 employees. Um, and the last four months have been the biggest natural experiment in white collar work that we've had in a century, right? So 3,000 employees in the last four months, it showed employee satisfaction with heads down concentrative activities at home was skyrocketing in the 70s and 80s. That's how many employees were saying that they were doing better working from home, doing that kind of work. On the other hand, for collaborative work or somewhat surprisingly, but also not surprisingly, if like you've been following the research, uh, career development is a place where employees mm -hmm. were saying, I can't do that when I'm at home. I don't have those spontaneous interactions with my boss or with my coworkers that I would have if I was just walking around the office going for a coffee. So that's the, that's the crazy thing about this moment. We're really beginning to see through the data that the workplace was really good at some things, but there are other things that it was not very good at and working from home or working remotely is better in those categories. Yeah, I, you know, I and I don't have the best memory, but I read so much stuff and I try to stay up on the latest because if I if I miss it, it technology moves so fast and everything's moving so quickly, um, I'm, I'm doing a disservice to uh, my clients and to all the people out there I'm trying to help. And one of the things I found is people working in the workplace a study, and I cannot remember where this came from, on average, productivity, about two hours and 43 minutes of productive work during an eight hour work day. Um, yeah. Working in an office, water coolers, I guess, going out for, I don't know, smoke breaks or, you know, yeah. throwing the <laughs> paper airplane at the at the cubicle next to you. I don't know. Um, yeah. it, it seems to me from a productivity standpoint, remote work is amazing. Yep. Now, conversely speaking, where are some of the biggest challenges you're finding when people are going and working remotely? Yeah, yeah, so it's in the collaboration, right? Let's be clear when we say productivity, we mean individual productivity. Thank and then you. collaboration is team productivity, right? So when companies are chasing productivity, they're really thinking about these two pieces. So one area is that team productivity, right? If, I, if I'm doing a whiteboard session with my team, it takes me longer, it's much clunkier, it's less fluid, uh, to do that over over a video call, right? Uh, we're lucky because our organization works in small teams, but some of our customers and honestly, some of my friends are used to having large, large meetings where you've got 15 people involved. So the idea of a 15 person Zoom call to me seems so crazy. That's a two person conversation with 13 observers, right? It's not meant 
for the type of collaboration that you could otherwise do if you were all in a space together where, you know, you know, one person jumps in, then another, you just can't do that over Zoom as well. So team, team productivity or collaboration is one area where that suffers for sure. Uh, and then the other areas we sort of touched on, right? They're, they're a bit softer, but they're crucial for a business over time. Uh, if you're going to attract and onboard and retain new employees, it's hard to do that if that employee never sees uh, in person one of their colleagues. Uh, I have a friend, and, and we wrote about this in one of our recent blog posts. So I have a friend who started at an organization remote uh, a couple of months ago. He was really excited about this business. And they have a no-nonsense, work-hard culture. And he is struggling because he's unable to form those types of bonds that would otherwise help him kind of get through some of the harder periods in his work. He's just unable to do that. They don't, you know, no matter how many happy hours you host over Zoom, you're not going to be able to make up for the kind of spontaneous relationship building that takes place in an office. Um, and that's that trust piece, right? It's a, it's, it's soft, right? We're, we're data driven in every way that we can, but you can't ignore this piece. We try to measure it from every side that we can, uh, but there's truly something there. And even though we're not seeing it now over the months that come, I am confident that we will see in terms of retention rates at companies, the numbers sliding, for example. You know, I've seen in particular, I've, I've kept hearing the younger generation are, are experiencing the the most challenges with this, at, at least from, from my writing. I can't prove it or anything like that. This is me talking. I take full responsibility for this. Yeah. But I've heard a lot of the younger generation, um, Generation Z, I think they're called. I'm not sure. I think it loops around the alphabet at this point. Well, yeah, yeah. One of those down there. But they're having a really hard time because us as human beings, we're, we're social beings, right? We need to be around people. Um, but there is part of what I've also found as far as distributed workforce, kind of operationally speaking, I found has helped us. I'm a big systems and processes freak. I love workflows. I love step-by-step -step because this does two things. It helps me understand that everybody on the team understands what their roles and responsibilities are. Plus, if we bring somebody else on, they can leverage the step-by-step -step workflow yeah. to help reduce the learning curve and they get up to speed a lot quicker, in my opinion. Yep. I found that through distributed workforces or through remote-based teams, that it almost forces us to process out or systemize the business in a more detailed manner to help. And I've also found that the, and I have to tell you, um, we are 100% remote. The only other person I've met besides my wife who works with us is another gentleman that I met playing hockey here in my town of Springfield, Missouri all right. with us. Everybody else I've never met in person. They're all in the Philippines. I've never met them in person. And the longest person that's been with me is six years, almost wow. seven years. Wow. But we've built up such a tremendous culture because of the relationships. And, and you're right. I'm, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and technology has only improved. But we have birthday parties. Um, we, we did a big uh, Christmas party. Uh, well, I guess you could say holiday party, sorry. Um, and where everybody got together and we were singing and we were playing games and we've have a blast. We know about each other's families. So there are things that you can do, but it's, it's rare. And I think the direction that we're going, we need to find out which group of people, number one, has the personality yes. to do this, but number two, has the capability and the wherewithal to actually benefit from this type of digital relationship. And I'd love to hear what to you. Totally, totally. So first of all, that's impressive. I've heard of a, a few cases, obviously, of organizations that have been able to swing a 100% remote culture. Um, but if there's one kind of takeaway that I want to leave on the table here, it's the idea of a hybrid model, right? Mm -hmm. It's the idea of a blended model. And that's where everything is trending here, right? There's no reason why a company needs to choose between one thing or the other thing. They both have value for the company. They both allow the company to do certain things that that company wouldn't be able to do without the other. So if we break it down as simply as possible, we're talking about individual productivity and team productivity, right? Or we're talking about the ability for me not to have to commute to the office on the one hand, but then on the other hand, the ability for me to have great career development and spontaneous interactions and, and, and so on and so forth. 
And every single company where they draw the line is going to be unique to them. And just like you said, it's going to be a product of two things. We look at it the exact same way. There are two components. And now let's get into the data, right? Yes. The one component, the one component is sentiment. It's very important to measure sentiment. Who wants to, who has the personality to, who, uh, who, who, and you know, you're seeing that today in terms of the people who are opting in to come back to the office and the people who are opting out the times, uh, Rhoda actually is a, is a pew poll and it was about a month ago or maybe, maybe two at this point. And it said 60% of Americans wanted to stay working from home even after the pandemic was over. And that blew my mind. Uh, and sentiment can change, right? Maybe that's the situation now. And after a couple more months, it's all going to get tedious. But that is, uh, that's a fact. And that's a, that, that came from a survey, right? So that's one side. Every organization needs to run that type of qualitative survey on their own. On the other side, you've got to really look at the numbers uh, of how people are doing their jobs, what makes them productive. So at Dojo, we call this a work style. And we have figured out a number of data sources. What do you call that? A work style, an individual work style. Yeah. Uh, and the way we do it is we'll crunch data about how people spend their time over the course of, say, 90 days. Are they predominantly on calls, uh, calls out or calls that are internal to the company? Are they in meetings, right? In a, in a previous era, we would distinguish between those. Uh, are they doing heads down work? Are they, do they have long chunks of time on their calendar where they're just trying to get stuff done, right? There are a number of different data sources that we're able to layer together in order to create this picture of an individual work style. And it's unique to every single company. That's the key thing. Um, instead of sort of trying to fit people into boxes, our algorithm is able to identify in a custom way what those groups are for each company. And when you have these two pictures side by side, on the one hand, the sentiment does you know, does Jamie feel like he wants to come into the office or is he totally happy hanging out with his dog at home? And then on the other hand, is Jamie's job going to benefit from him spending more time at home? When you have somebody who's a yes in both of those categories, oh my God, that person, person should stay home, right? Not only are they going to be more productive, but reduce your real estate costs, you know, uh, the, the list goes on and on of, of the benefits there. On the other hand, you'll have people who both want to come into the office and believe it or not, there are people who want to come back. We talked sure. about and people who in the data, they show up as uh, people who are going to benefit and be more productive from being around others. So those people, okay, prioritize getting them back in. And then you've got that middle and the middle is where it gets interesting. So, yeah, so you're right. So I was looking at if I'm trying to, um, paint a picture for people that are watching or listening. Dojo, in the example, I believe it was at like a 200 person firm uh, or company. And what you did was you analyzed them over a certain amount of time and then you color coordinated the different departments should you know, marketing be up here and sales down here. And when, when all actually what you found out was they needed to kind of be together in some, some situations um, some of them splintered off a little bit different areas. Yeah. So cool. What this software did is you could kind of move it around to see what part you could pull out for remote, what part needed to be more collaborative. Um, when I say part, I'm talking maybe teams or departments, right? Yeah. You know, marketing, exactly. whatever. And then you even color coded it to say, these group of people could come in on this day and these group of people can come in on this day. And, it, it was, it just made things seem so organized. And what many people don't understand is that by with this being data driven, it's not an end all be all. It's a suggestive starting point, in my opinion, to a bigger, brighter, better, um, higher profitability. I mean, any way you look at it, it's totally. a great way to start in this new post COVID world or COVID where you think we're at. Yeah, yeah the new normal. Totally. Yeah. So, it, you know, all of that stuff comes from uh, a field called people analytics or network science. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Jamie. No. Uh, uh -uh. So, so I'll explain a bit. And this is something that benefits from the visual. So I'll try to use my words. But essentially, if, if you've, you've ever seen a Facebook or LinkedIn 
uh, diagram where they show, all right, here's Jamie in Springfield and here are Jamie's friends all over the world. Here they are in the Philippines. Here they are in Europe, here, you know? So we're doing the same kind of analysis and producing the same types of diagrams for an organization. And what that allows us to do is leverage a lot of the tools and methods that have been developed in this field over the years. Uh, and we're able to use that to understand more about how an organization works and what makes people and teams in that organization effective. Uh, so let me give one, uh, uh, one example, kind of riffing off of what you were saying from what you remembered from the video. Once we load in all that data, and for data, we might use uh, how many Zoom calls people are on, are, are on with each other, all right? So Jamie, if you and I do an average of you know, 50 Zoom calls in a, in a three month period, we would have a connection, a line between us on this graph. And that line would be a certain thickness. And if, uh, if me and Joe did only five, we would be connected, but our line would be a little thinner on this, on this graph. We use an algorithm to rearrange, to, to mold this graph in a way where it identifies the natural neighborhoods and communities that emerge. So groups of people that are working together over and over again, we call this a bottom up org chart. Companies are used to looking at a top down hierarchical org chart where the boss is on top, everybody mm -hmm. reports the boss. That org chart is useful, but it's useful for understanding chain of command. It's not useful if what you wanna understand is how work actually gets done in, a, in, in most organizations. That work gets done horizontally more often than not. Uh, and pulling the data and seeing this uh, much more fluid diagram shows you exactly what I mean. And once you know those clusters, cluster is the, 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 the term in the literature for it, we call them neighborhoods or communities. Once you see those communities, you then start thinking, all right, these people really need to come into the office at the same time. If they come into the office, but they're not together, it defeats the purpose. That doesn't mean your entire marketing team needs to come in on the same day because not everybody in your marketing team is talking to everybody else in your marketing team. In fact, some group of them might be primarily interacting with salespeople um, and seeing all of those sort of deep insights is what helps companies make the right decisions in this super complex moment. Absolutely. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours. I have to tell you, I'm following every step of the, of the way with you. And, and for those others that may not understand, I think it, it will be clear soon. One of my one of the biggest challenges I had, keeping in mind, my staff is, is from the Philippines. So different time zones, all of that kind of stuff. And it took a while to kind of figure out, I need certain people here during the day when I'm here. And some of the people or some of the roles, I should say, I, I don't care when they work. I can see when they get their job done. We have to be um, very systematic in that approach. And there's a project management software and all that stuff that we have to go through. But our web developers or our graphic design, they can work when I'm sleeping. Totally. My personal assistant, we need to be on the same shift, <laughs> right? And, and all of this, I think, is learned. And for us, we didn't have a dojo.co or whatever. I can just imagine how much this is going to benefit so many companies in getting this set up. And here's, here's the thing, I think. When you're looking at who, who's, what companies are going to come out on the other end of this, you look at about the top 10%. What are that top 10% that's going to come out going to be more productive or whatever you want to use the word and successful and whatever that means to them? There's 10% of the companies that are going to do that. And I would, I'm, I'm moving towards it. That's our goal. We want to be in that top 10% that comes out on the other side of this because we need data. We need research. We need to take the time where we kind of lost a lot of business. Oh yeah. At the very beginning of this thing. And we put our heads down and we said, okay, how do we revise our system? How are we going to come out on the other side of this thing by creating a new category? But guess what? Now we met Dan Goldstein. Holy cow. There's a whole new dynamic that we can look at. And there's a lot of companies I think they're going to struggle with this. So what's the best way to get out in front of this? Data. Yep, that's right. That's absolutely right. So, I mean, just to elaborate on that point, Jamie, because I think it's a good one, because now is that moment, right? Um, the pandemic 
uh, is a milestone. And I think it's created a lot of complexity in the world, right? Before companies needed to think about, does this person sit in this chair or in this chair, right? Or companies just needed to think about who to hire, right? Now companies need to think about those questions plus all of these questions related to uh, location uh, and whether that person comes in uh, on shift A or on shift B, whether that person works from home or from the office, whether that person is hired in San Francisco or that person is hired in, uh, in, in Houston or Dallas, right? So all of these questions multiply uh, the level of complexity and the solution to it's that. Security. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. On top of that, um, without data, it's it's hard to navigate. It's scary to navigate. So what would you say um, that you're, God, there's so many questions I have for you, but what would you say is the greatest thing about Dojo right now that you're, you're most proud of that you can see is most helpful? I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I grew up in New York. Um, I'm in Brooklyn right now. And a lot of people are going out and they're saying that New York City is done for and people are leaving the city and so on and so forth. And, you know, we talked about how a hybrid model for workers is kind of the way that this is going to go. But I am sort of proud of the companies in New York that are, that are opening back up. OK, and I'm I'm excited that we're able to play a role in that. Uh, we're not about we're not about saying no to physical workplaces. We're about helping companies figure out what they need to do next. And a big part of that is always keeping their presence, opening up and so on. So I would say that that's the exciting thing right now. Good for you, man. That's awesome. How do people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you? Uh, they can check it out at dojo.co, dojo.co, or email me directly, dan at dojo.co. Um, and you know, we'd be happy to show them some, uh, some good ways that we can, uh, that we can crunch the data together. Yeah, that's sweet. Dan, I, I, I seriously cannot thank you enough for, uh, stopping by. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with before we wrap up today? Look, it's, I mean, I think we've talked through all of it. Um, the sort of one thing to leave on the table, like I said, is this idea of a, a hybrid model. And, and Jamie, you've talked about how the remote model has worked for you. And I think it's gonna work for more and more companies out there. So that's really where people are dipping their toes. They're moving to that from the traditional office idea. Um, but the place to settle is somewhere in the middle. And it's about figuring out where that middle is for every company. So that's what I, I leave up there. I, I can't agree with you more. Dan, uh, seriously, man, thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your wisdom. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap? That's it. That's it, Jamie. Thank you for having me on here. Hey, thank you. If you can, hold on one quick second. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, uh, but hold on one brief second. I'll be, I'll be right there. Perfect. Um, hey, uh, seriously, if you get a chance, reach out to Dan. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there. Um, my buddies over at Core Properties, you have to look at dojo.co. I'm telling you, this is really going to help you out, especially with all the properties you guys own, with companies coming and going and all of that stuff. Uh, and anybody else out there that has any questions, please let me know. If you ask a question or you comment on one of the different uh, social media channels at a later time, I will make sure to get Dan the information. And I do apologize for the technical glitch today with me. It looks like, a, as Dan said, I'm wearing a velour sweater. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My name is Jamie J. I'm the CEO and founder of Bottleneck Virtual Assistance. We have been talking uh, with the co-founder of Dojo, Dan Goldstern, about the future of work and workplace and the workplace. Highly, highly recommend that uh, you learn more about dojo.co and uh, Dan there. So without any further ado, thank you so much for tuning in today. And uh, if there's anything else we can do, please feel free to re reach out. Remember, make your own ripple. Let's do this. Let's take this thing on. All right.